You can be seated, and uh, except for our little ones in grade five and below, if you feel led to take make a jailbreak, this is your window of opportunity. Otherwise, you could be stuck for a while, just warning you. So we got Miss Pamela back here to lead the crew. So for the rest of us, for the we're starting a new series this week. This week for the month of September, we're going to be talking about following the servant king. You know, Jesus was interesting in the history of the world because he was a king who became a servant, or he was a servant who became a king. He's a king and a servant, and that's the genius of who Jesus is and what Jesus came to do. And we're going to look at the dynamics of that. Next week is a special Sunday. You want to come here because we got a free lunch. At least it's free to you if you come. And, uh, and it's a free lunch because we're celebrating the installation of our first uh, diaconal ministry team. And uh, we're just excited about the way our church is growing and developing and how different people are stepping up and getting involved in different ways. And, uh, and a big part of our, our church is the service aspect. And, and uh, so we have a team of people that's come together who's excited to be formally recognized and then and then to further organize our church's efforts in that area so so come next week and bring a friend you know if you know anyone who's looking for a free lunch this is the place to be next uh next sunday you just have to sit through church so maybe maybe it's not, not so free but uh anyways to start off the the interesting thing is everybody got that jesus was a king as he came or or his followers got his intimates got the message that he was a king, but then he kept correcting them and clarifying that he was a king who came to serve. And that's where it kind of blew their minds. They didn't understand what he was talking about or how this could be. But we're going to look at one of these passages here that I think the, the disciples didn't understand until much later. It's from Mark chapter 10. It's printed out in your program. And it's about an interaction that Jesus has with his disciples that they later shared with us. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who are two of the disciples, they came to Jesus and they said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked them. They replied, Well, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. So Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. You will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right and left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Now when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. With you, whoever wants to become great must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first will have to be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as the ransom for many. This is God's word for God's people this morning. I like the boldness of the disciples. They just come to Jesus and they just say exactly what they're thinking. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we tell you to do. And, you know, it, it sounds funny at one level to hear a guy, to hear the disciples come to Jesus and talk to him that way. But on the other hand, I think that's, basically how most of us approach God most of the time. If we have prayers, we have issues in our life, we come to God and we say, God, I want you to take care of this situation. I've got this problem with my kid and you need to solve it. I've got this problem with my help, health and you need to resolve it. I've got this problem at work and you need to help me fix it. And so we want God, we expect God to solve the problems that we give him and to resolve them the way that we want them to be resolved. And the reason I know this is because when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want them to, then what happens? We get 
angry, right? We get frustrated. We're like, well, prayer doesn't work. Or, and, I, you know, over the years, I've talked to many people who say, well, I used to go to church. I used to be a believer, but I'm not anymore. And you know what it almost always comes down to? In my experience, in talking to these people, as they open up to me, they say, well, there was this situation in the, the, my life. I prayed for my kid to get better, and they didn't. I prayed for, for my career to go a certain way, and it hasn't. I prayed, I prayed for a relationship to be reconciled, and it wasn't. And, and when God didn't answer that prayer, I figured, well, what good is God at all? Why should I even begin to follow him? But what we see here is when we come to God and say, God, we need you to do for us whatever we ask, we're missing the bigger picture because we can't even conceive of the bigger picture that God is, is bringing to pass in our life. We can't see the larger narrative that God is accomplishing in us and around us and even through us. Now, some of you are parents and you know kind of what this feels like. You know, if you ever had a kid who comes to you about a half hour before dinner and says, I'm starving, I need to eat right now. And, you know, mom replies, you know, I don't think you're starving because you had lunch three hours ago and in about a half hour we're going to have uh, dinner, so I think you're actually going to be just fine. There's no chance of you starving to death before dinner, but no, you can't have any candy bars right now. And so the kid melts down to the kid is feeling hunger pangs and the kid wants to be fed right away even though they're completely taken care of. Any of you ever seen that in a kid you know? You don't need to raise hands, but, but, <laughs> but, or even been like that, some of you. <laughs> but, but see, that's what we're like with God because we come to God and we have some felt need, we have some, some problem and we want God to resolve it on our timetable, in our way, according to our plan. And God says, you know, there's a bigger plan here and you're going to have to trust me. We make our demands with God and then sometimes the way God works in our life is confusing. And we don't understand why is God allowing these things to happen? Why is God allowing this situation to fall apart? Why is God allowing this pain? Why is God allowing the struggle? Why is God allowing this, this defeat in my life? And the challenge for you and for me is to trust him in the midst of these things because what the Bible shows us over and over again for the people of God is that God has a much bigger plan that we can't begin to comprehend. God has a more complicated plan than, than we can imagine and our calling is simply to trust him in that and to discover what our place in that grant, what our small place in his grand plan is for us. And so Jesus is trying to do that with his disciples in this place. They come to him and they say, we want you to do with us for us whatever we ask. And Jesus says, well, that depends what you're asking for, right? And they say, well, it's, it's really simple. They, they said, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. And what were they looking for here? Well, they understood that Jesus was the Messiah, and they understood the popular understanding of what the Messiah was supposed to do, according to the first century Jews. The Messiah was going to be the one who came in and reestablished the glory of Israel. He was going to defeat the Romans, and he was going to ascend to the throne in Jerusalem and bring in this golden age for the people of God. And they wanted to make sure that when that happened, and when he was sitting in the throne there in Jerusalem, and when the glory was returned, that they were at his right hand and his left hand. And Jesus says, you don't understand how this Messiah thing is going to work. In fact, you still have absolutely no clue how this is going to work. Even though Jesus had said over and over again what was going to happen, they still were visualizing this gilded palace with Jesus on the big throne, and then they wanted to be at his right hand and his left hand as his assistants. And you know how it actually worked out? is when Jesus entered into his glory, the glory of the cross, what happened? There were two thieves nailed, two crosses on his right and his left. It says in, in Luke, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified Jesus there, along with two criminals on his right and on his left. 
And see, the disciples thought that when Jesus entered into his glory, there'd be a throne. But when Jesus entered into his glory, when Jesus had his decisive victory, there wasn't a throne, there was a cross. They wanted the throne, they didn't want the cross. And when we're following God, we want him to do whatever we ask. And mostly what we want, what we want is to avoid the crosses and find the thrones. And that's not how following Jesus works. Do you see how far the disciples were? In spite of the fact that Jesus says over and over again, if you read the Gospels over and over again, he's saying, we're going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be crucified, and three days later I'm going to rise from the dead. They, they didn't even hear him say that. And so they were envisioning their journey to Jerusalem and the work of Jesus purely as an ascent to the cross when he was to, to the throne when he was going to the cross. And it's the same for us. You know, God doesn't answer our prayers. God doesn't work things out in our life the way we want to. But that's because he's got a bigger plan for us than we can imagine. And it's our challenge is to trust in him and to continue to be faithful to him even when things aren't working out the way that we want to and believe that he's got a bigger plan and he's got a be better plan. Because Jesus was a king of glory, but he was also a king who suffered. And that was what the disciples couldn't gather, was that he was a king who was going to execute his kingship through his suffering. But he wasn't just a king who suffered, he was also a king who came to serve. Jesus came to serve, but his disciples weren't about serving. You know, in fact, his disciples were all, at this point, ambitious guys who thought that they were on the fast track to wealth and power and glory. And that's why they were staying with Jesus. And so we know this is the case because when the other disciples heard about the request of James and John, it says they were indignant. Look at verse 41. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with James and John. And so, you know, what they were saying is, wait a minute, if James and John get the one spot and the two spot in this new kingdom, that means the, the other 10 of us are just going to be stuck fighting over spots number 3 through 12. And that's not fair. We wanted to be in those spots. And so it starts this argument among the disciples, and they're all, they're all going at each other. And so Jesus says, oh, geez, what, what am I going to do with these people? And and so he brings them all together and he tries to explain to them again that his kingdom is another kind of kingdom. It says, look, look at verse 43. It says, Jesus called his disciples together. He realized they're squabbling among themselves. And he says, you know, those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So Jesus came as a king who served. And that's what they couldn't understand, because greatness in this world is a function of how many people serve you. Greatness in the kingdom is a function of how much you serve. Greatness in this world is a function of how much you have. Greatness in the kingdom is a function of how much you give. Greatness in this world is a function of how many people are available to help you. Greatness in the kingdom is a function of how many people you can help. And the greatness of Jesus was that he was a king who came to serve. And so the message for us, if we're going to follow him, is that if we want to have greatness as the kingdom defines greatness, we need to be willing to serve. We need, if we want to be significant in the kingdom, we need to be willing to give. If you want to find your life, as Jesus says in another place, you need to be willing to lay down your life. See, that, that's a different kind of greatness and, and an a interesting thing happens because see when you're struggling for power when you're struggling for dominance it's a zero-sum gain you know if somebody wins someone else has to lose if someone comes in first place everyone else has to come in second third or fourth place and so so it's always that that struggle to to climb to the top of the peak at, to, to the top of the hill and push everybody off and that's what James and John were trying to do here but if 
the kingdom comes through service, if the kingdom comes through sacrifice, then it's not a zero-sum gain. It's, it's all about making the kingdom greater, making the kingdom pure, and everybody benefits the more people are seeking greatness in the kingdom, the more people are progressing in the kingdom because we're progressing by serving, because we're progressing by giving, because we're progressing by putting others ahead of ourselves. And so we experience not the power of dominating other people, but the power of blessing and of multiplying the blessings of God. Because the blessings of God in our life multiply as we give them away. The grace of God in our life grows as we share it with others. And that's what Jesus was trying to lead the people of Israel to. See, Jesus was a king who, who came to suffer. He was a king who came to serve. And it was through his service that he accomplished and he established his kingdom. And, that, and it's understandable at a level that the, the disciples couldn't comprehend that he would be that kind of king because throughout human history and even to today, it's pretty consistent that when people attain power, they use it for their own enrichment. They use their power for their own, for their own glory. They use their power to just destroy all their enemies. And uh, as the saying goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so the disciples just wanted to make sure they were on the right side of Jesus' ascent to power so that when all of his enemies got crushed, they would be standing at the top of the heap. And so Jesus comes as a king. He comes as the Messiah, and he demonstrates that he has a lot of power, right? He has power over the wind and the waves. He can say to the wind and the waves, peace be still, and they're still. He, can, he has power over life and death. He can say to a person who's dead, Lazarus come out and he rises from the dead. He can feed the multitudes with five loaves and three fish. He can turn water into wine. No one was ever as powerful as Jesus. And I, I'm sure his disciples were sitting there thinking, you know, when he lets this loose, Rome and, the, and Caesar and the, Roman, the pagan Roman Empire is going to be wiped out before we know it. When he lets this loose, all of his critics in Israel are going to be devastated before in a, the blink of an eye. When he lets this loose, everybody's going to recognize his glory, and it is going to be great. World domination is just one word away with this guy, with the power he has, with the strength that he has. But you know the story. That's not what happened. He didn't take his power and use his power to crush his enemies. He didn't take his power and use his power to make himself look grand and glorious. Instead, what did he do? He surrendered his power. He yielded his power and was obedient to death. He gave himself up and sacrificed himself. You know why? Because his kingdom was a completely different kind of kingdom. He had a different agenda as a king. His agenda was, as he ascended to his place in his king, was not to destroy his enemies, but to redeem his enemies, not to kill his adversaries, but to convert his adversaries, not to crush those who opposed him, but to save those who opposed him. That was his agenda for his kingdom. Because, see, it's easy to crush and kill and destroy your enemies if you have that power. You know, you can drop a bomb on them. You can, you can do all, any number of things to kill somebody who, who is opposing you, who is threatening you. But you know what's hard? It's hard to redeem your adversaries. It's hard to convert your adversaries. It's hard to heal those who are broken. It's hard to restore what's been destroyed. And Jesus came not to crush and kill and destroy, but to convert and to heal and to redeem and to restore. And that was the challenge of his ministry. And that's why it was so difficult. With the power he had, it would have been easy for him to wipe out Caesar, to wipe out his adversaries, and to reveal his glory and get everybody to follow him. But the problem is, if he had exerted his power that way, he would have had to not just wipe out the pagan king Caesar, but also 
all the people of Israel who didn't recognize that he was the Messiah. And if he was going to use his power that way, he wouldn't have had any use for those disciples of his who just didn't comprehend at all what he was going to do and, and were just using him as a means to get what they wanted. They just wanted him to do for, the, for them whatever they asked. And so he didn't come that way. He came to restore. He came to redeem. He came to heal. He came to save. But to do that, he had to take a different approach. I mean, imagine this. Imagine a guy gets, gets badly beat up on, on the street somewhere, and he's, he's left almost for dead. And uh, it just takes five minutes of a few people kicking him, punching him, and beating on him, and, and, he, and he's left there. And, and that's over. But now, that guy, if he's going to recover, what's it going to take? It's going to take some EMTs who show up and carefully assess his situation and transfer him to a gurney and transport him to the hospital. And then when he gets to the hospital, it's going to take the care of a bunch of nurses and other medical professionals to, to assess his situation, to perform the procedures, to, to reset the bones that are broken, to reattach the tendons that have been severed, to sew up the wounds that have been opened, to stop the bleeding, to save his life. And then... And then after that, you guys know if you've been through something like this, that's going to be weeks of just sitting there waiting for your body to, to heal. And while you're, while you're waiting, you're going to need a lot of people attending to you, maybe medical professionals who come and care for you and, and help you do for, do, do for you what you can't do for yourself. And then they're going to send you home. And hopefully, you have some friends. Hopefully, you have some family that's going to check in on you, who's going to be able to take care of you and help you recover, recover slowly. Because see, the work of, of destroying something, that can be done in just a minute. That can even be done by mistake. That can be done when you're not paying attention. But the work of healing, the work of restoration, the work of redeeming a life, that is hard. And for Jesus, Jesus could have come and God could have come and they could have just destroyed this planet and started over. But God wanted to do something even more difficult, something even more profound, something even more powerful by redeeming this planet and by redeeming our lives. The disciples didn't get that because they didn't want that. They wanted the power. They wanted the glory. They wanted the grandeur. They wanted the riches right now, right here and right now. But it's a good thing for those disciples that Jesus had another approach because if he had just wanted to destroy all, everybody who was not reliable to him and everyone who was not faithful to him, he would have had to, they would have been caught up in the fire. There is no doubt about that. And so, and it's a good thing for you and for me that Jesus came to redeem and that Jesus came to restore and that Jesus came to renew and Jesus came to convert because that's the only reason any of us have any hope. The reason the coming of Christ is good news is because he entered into this world, he entered into the brokenness of the world, not to punish it, not to discard it, but to restore it, not to condemn the sinners, but to forgive, not to defeat, but to convert. Jesus is the rich one who became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. He's the God who became man so that we who are men might be brought up to God. He's the immortal one who died so that we could live forever. He's the righteous one who became sin so that we might become righteous in him. You know, it's a good thing that Jesus didn't do for you, doesn't do for you and for me and for the disciples and for everyone else what we want him to do. Because if he did that, to be real, we'd all just destroy ourselves. He has a bigger agenda than just satisfying our impulses, a bigger agenda than so solving the immediate problem that we might be facing right now. Because he came to redeem, he came to restore, he came to heal, and he came to make everything new because he's a different kind of king, starting a different kind of kingdom. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life to rans as a ransom for many. And that's what the world needs. And you know what, my friends? That's what you need too. 
not with swords loud clashing or roll of raging drums, but with deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that Christ came to serve. I thank you that Christ came to give himself, and I pray that, that you would show us what it means to follow him and to experience his grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.